Okay, uh, so uh, this is a dissection kit, um, and the link between me and this dissection kit is uh, the kit belongs to, or belonged to, um, uh, the PhD student who worked for my mentor years before I was there. Her name is uh, Eileen Furlong. And Eileen went on to become uh, probably the most successful Irish scientist uh, of our generation. God, why have I never heard of her? <laughs> she moved to Germany. Okay. And uh, she's now the director of um, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory there, EMBL, in Heidelberg. She's the director of EMBL? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, she's the head of genetics in, okay. Okay. in, in EMBL. Um, and it's a circular story, I suppose. I inherited her dissection kit after she left the lab and Fidian went on to become my mentor. And, uh, you know, 20 years later, uh, I find myself coming back to think about Eileen a lot and what she does in her, in her job because of um, the impact that her work has had subsequently on ours. So what do you use the dissection kit for? Uh, I, I, I still use it now uh, in pharmacology practicals. Really? Um, you actually still use it? Yeah. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah, we use it during our dissections in stage three. Okay. That's why mine's much bloodier than... Yeah, than this one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, one. Yeah. And what's in it? Like, there's scissors and... What are the paintbrushes for? Uh, so they're for um, when you're making sort of uh, glass slides and sections and things where you might need to uh, just tidy up around the edges. Like, they're, when you buy the kits, they've got all these funny things in them yeah. that are, aren't used for... I would say that if you were to ask me which ones would I use, for example, in my dissections, really, the scissors and the probe right. are probably all you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's nice to have the fancy bag and the lovely... Oh, you gotta, you got to keep it in... Well, you know, if you were to open up mine, I wonder how many of the original pieces are left. <laughs> probably very few of the original pieces are still there because they just get mixed up. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it, when I first started doing the practicals when I was very early on in my academic career. Uh, I'd never done it before. Like I'm not, I didn't do my undergraduate degree as in pharmacology. Um, but I had dissected animals before. Mm -hmm. I'd never run practicals like this before. So I had to pick it up very, very quickly. And over a period of um, probably a year or two, I went from being a complete amateur to the only expert. In fact, they talk about institutional memory, don't they? Mm. The institutional memory for these practicals is me. Yeah. Trying yeah, to pass I'd it well on. I'd well believe it. Yeah, I'd well believe it. Trying to pass it on. So it's interesting, though, that to be a pharmacologist or to stu even to study pharmacology, you have to have a certain set of like actually practical skills you have to be able to manipulate tools and yeah. work in a kind of it's fine you're working with very small pieces of tissue and fiddly they are i mean i think that there to be an experimental pharmacologist um, and to train as an experimental pharmacologist you do require a very specific set of skills um, one of the things in drug discoveries i'm sure yeah. you know you know yourself is that we can't just take a drug that I've made in the laboratory and give it to you, that um, it needs to be very well characterised. And part of this is understanding how it works within molecular systems, particularly complex systems like animals. Um, and uh, although in many cases, you know, animal research per se remains very controversial um, for the development of pharmaceutics and the testing of safety and efficacy, mm. uh, it's still, you know, the gold standard as it were. So what's this? So this is this is the replacement for this I guess. Um, this is a, a bioreactor, um, a plastic disposable bioreactor. You're supposed to throw them away after one use but we wash them and reuse them a number of times. Because so so what, what, what is your name? Who are you? Oh sorry yeah um, my name's um, John Crean and um, I'm a pharmacologist um, I trained initially as a biochemist, but I kind of masquerade as a stem cell biologist. At okay, the stem cell biologist, yeah. okay. Uh, so one of the great ideas, I suppose, is that instead of using animals for testing drugs, that we can use uh, organotypic, uh, you know, stem, st st sorry, stem cell derived materials that look like and behave like uh, animal tissues or human tissues. And that's what we do with these. We um, take stem cells and we 
um, specify those stem cells. And what that means is we just use a, a very small set of um, biochemical cues to tell that stem cell to become something else. And um, the something else that it becomes is user-defined. So I know it sounds kind of strange, um, but it's now within our capacity to mimic the development of nearly every organ in the human body. I sort of feel like I need to lie down after having heard that. <laughs> it's sort of a monumental thing to hear. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to overplay it. Mm. Um, we don't make fully functioning humans, <clears throat> excuse me. But what we do is we make uh, parts of the body that are organotypic, that is that they sort of look like and behave like the organ. And uh, the hope is that in the very near future that these organ or organoids, as we call them, um, that they will in, in many cases be able to replace animals for drug testing, for example, but also serve as models of disease um, if they behave appropriately and to the human or in an, a sort of equivalent way to the human organ, then we should be able to, to use them to model disease. And um, in the ultimate fantasy, of course, is the, the issue of growing something that can be used as replacement tissue. And um, earlier, or I should say last year, later last year, in December last year, um, the very first successful transplantation of stem cell derived uh, islets from the pancreas were implanted into uh, a very lucky middle-aged type 1 diabetic in uh, New York and he's now walking around quite happily with his stem cell derived islets providing I believe 90% of his insulin daily insulin requirement which means that uh, ostensibly in this, in this particular patient that they've cured his type 1 diabetes. Remarkable. Yeah, Com completely I, incredible. And you know, even now saying it, when I say it, tell students and tell my friends and tell my colleagues, <laughs> you get, everything got subsumed into the pandemic, didn't it? Um, that we, we sort of miss these monumental breakthroughs. And when you hear about it, you go, you know, uh, did they cure diabetes? I said, well, they haven't cured diabetes, but they've cured one person's diabetes. And that's a great place to start. So you are actually in your lab here in UCD, growing, using this bioreactor here, or yeah. something like it, growing small organoids, and I've actually seen them when I say small, they're really tiny, the, the, um, organoids of different tissues. Yeah. Different, and they contain all the different cell types that might be in a, a kidney, for example, or that might be in um, a pancreas. That's exactly it. Yeah. So, of course, um, most organs are very complex mm. because they have many different cell types. And up until now, it's been very difficult to model anything on an organ level because of this complexity. Uh, but uh, advances in techniques and technologies have me meant that you can take very complex multicellular organs and do experiments on those organs that previously we wouldn't have been able to do. Mm. So you can uh, look at gene expression at the level of an individual cell, whereas previously it would have been <laughs> gene expression at the level of an individual organ, if you like. Um, so it means that the heterogeneity within an organoid becomes an advantage rather than a disadvantage. The fact that there are multiple cells there, multiple cell types, means that in effect you can carry out an experiment or you can mimic disease in which all of the cells uh, track what is happening to every cell at the same time, which is, which is really fantastic. It's incredible. Now you said at the beginning there, you casually mentioned that, there's, that these organoids are stem cell derived. What does that mean? Right, so the starting material are stem cells. Um, and, and what are stem cells? So I, I suppose the best way to think about a stem cell is as a, an open template, um, a cell that has the capacity to um, differentiate into any other cell in the body. Uh, they maintain themselves within this state of stemness by uh, a very sort of clever self-sustaining trick uh, in which in the absence of a differentiation signal, the cells retain um, 
their phenotype, but that is, they don't differentiate. So, for example, um, in the fertilized embryo, um, those cells are what we would refer to initially as um, totipotent, and then they go through, which means that basically they can become they can, any, yeah. yeah, the totality of potency, as it were. Yeah. Um, and then pluripotent is as they differentiate, as the first stages of differentiation take place, they lose some of that capacity. And then as the cells become the different organs of the body, they become what we used to refer to as terminally differentiated. And for a long period of time, uh, it was our understanding that cells followed this pathway in a single direction, that they went from um, a stem cell, an embryo, to a differentiated tissue like a muscle or skin or eye or brain. Now, about, um, I suppose, 10 years ago, 2006, um, a very clever scientist and modern day hero um, figured out a way in which you can uh, reprogram an adult cell so that it acquires this state of stemness. So that's remarkable. You're actually, that, that discovery means that you can actually sort of turn the clock back. That's exactly it. Which is why I have yeah. this watch here on the table that we have this idea that development and that life goes in a direction, but sure. that this discovery means that actually it's possible to turn the clock back and bring a cell that's a liver cell or a kidney cell back to being a stem cell or to having some stemness, yeah. stem life. Stemness, is yeah. a, it's a really good word because I think um, we, we call it reprogramming. Um, the technique that we used um, was developed by, as I said, um, my hero, yeah. uh, Shinya Yamanaka, who subsequently won the Nobel Prize for uh, discovering this technique. It's very, very simple, very, very beautiful and elegant, and involves a very small number of factors, which was, I think, the most remarkable thing. That when you say factors, you mean literally like substances that you apply or that's add? That's a good way or, of looking at it, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're actually proteins, transcription factors. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the technique of adding we would call overexpression in, in this case, mm -hmm. um, but it only required ultimately three factors to facilitate um, the acquisition of stemness. So you could take a terminally differentiated cell and turn it back into something that had plasticity. So it's like reversing the developmental process. Um, so that's, that's actually what you do? Yes. Yes, and then... Um, so wait a minute now, that's what you do. So you take skin cells. Well, it could be, it could be skin. You can, you can take any starting material okay. um, and you uh, use a virus to infect those cells with a small number of these factors, the Yamanaka factors, um, normally four. And these four factors are induced or transduced into these cells and then over a period of time, small parts of the population's and persist, become stem-like, and we then pick those and grow them up as colonies, and then those colonies are characterized. Um, and given a, a stemness sort of quotient, if you want, or a stemness, I don't know what you call it, mm. uh, coefficient. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. A stemness coefficient, and that stemness coefficient will tell you um, what the potential of that cell is then to differentiate into different types of tissues. It's a good indicator, it's not, mm. not a rule, but a good indicator of how um, plastic the cells would be. And uh, so we started using these cells about uh, seven or eight years ago to generate kidney-like structures. And that's really what, what, what our main game is at the moment, is to, um, to try to make better models of, of kidney disease. So these little organoids that you grow in this bioreactor contain all the different cell types that exist in a kidney, or many of them anyway. They could, but the, we normally use these ones for growing little brains. <laughs> so, um, yeah, which of course is a different story, but the same story. Okay. Um, well, we might have to leave that one for another time, John. We might, we might have to, yeah. <laughs> Thanks a million. Thanks a million yeah. for talking to me.